Hello, everyone. My name is William Armeline, and I'm the director of the San Jose State University Human Rights Institute. On behalf of SJSU, the incredible faculty and staff of the Human Rights Working Group, and our amazing students in the Human Rights Minor Program, I would like to welcome you to the final event of the 2021 Human Rights Lecture Series, the 2021 Human Rights Keynote Lecture from Dr. Angela Davis on Black Feminism, Socialism, and the Human Rights Struggles of Our Time. Following Dr. Davis's talk, she'll be joined in conversation by organizers Jose Valle and uh, Sharon Watkins of Silicon Valley Debug and the Care First, Jail Last Coalition to discuss the abolitionist movement in California to replace jails with non-carceral alternatives. Before we begin, let me quickly thank our generous campus co-sponsors for supporting this year's series. The Mosaic Cross-Cultural Center, the Cesar Chavez Community Action Center, the Ethnic Studies Collaborative, the College of Social Sciences, the Departments of African American Studies, Sociology, Justice Studies, Political Science, Journalism and Mass Communications, and History, and community co-sponsors, Silicon Valley Debo. We are delighted to offer this free series to our people in the Bay Area, across the country, and around the world to kick off Black History Month and our promotional drive as a new research and policy institute. Please take a few minutes to check out our website to learn more about our team, students, and work. For instance, we're working with the California Assembly and Senate members now on the, Clear, on the CLEAR Act, the first bill in the nation meant to address the infiltration of law enforcement agencies by white nationalists and other extremist organizations in the country following the Capitol riots on January 6th. If you'd like to see more free programming like this month's series, or if you would like to support the impactful work of our faculty and students, please consider making a donation to the, the SJSU HRI today. It's support from people like you that give us the resources and independence to take on such critical social problems and accompany our community partners in struggle. Before Dean Jacobs joins us to introduce Dr. Davis, I have a quick housekeeping item. We encourage you to submit questions throughout the event for Dr. Davis and our panelists. To submit a question, click on the Q&A function on the bottom of your toolbar. Please keep questions brief and appropriate. We'll pose these questions to our guests for the final portion of tonight's event. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce Walt Jacobs, Dean of the College of Social Sciences, to introduce this year's Human Rights Lecture Series keynote speaker. Thanks, Will. Good evening, everyone. It is my honor to introduce Dr. Angela Davis. Through her activism and scholarship over many decades, Dr. Davis has been deeply involved in movements for social justice around the world. Her work as an educator, both at the edu university level and in the larger public sphere, has emphasized the importance of building communities of struggle for economic, racial, and gender justice. Professor Davis's teaching career has taken her to San Francisco State University, Mills College, and UC Berkeley. She has also taught at UCLA, Vassar, Syracuse University, the Claremont Colleges, and Stanford University. Most recently, she spent 15 years at the University of California, Santa Cruz, where she is now Distinguished Professor Emerita of History of Consciousness and Feminist Studies. Professor Davis is the author of 10 books and has lectured throughout the United States, as well as in Europe, Africa, Asia, Australia, and South America. In recent years, a persistent theme of her work has been the range of social problems associated with incarceration and the generalized criminalization of these communities that are most affected by poverty and racial discrimination. She draws upon her own experience in the early 70s as a person who spent 18 months in jail and on trial after being placed on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. She has also conducted extensive research on numerous issues related to race, gender, and imprisonment. Her recent books include Abolition Democracy and Are Prisons Obsolete? She has also published a new edition of Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass and a collection of essays entitled The Meaning of Freedom. Her most recent book of essays is called Freedom is a Constant Struggle, Ferguson, Palestine, and the Foundations of a Movement. Like many educators, Professor Davis is especially concerned with the general tendency to devote more resources and attention to the prison system than to educational institutions. Having helped to popularize the notion of a prison industrial complex, she now urges her audiences to think seriously about the future possibility of a world without prisons and to help forge a 21st century abolitionist movement. On a personal note, when I was a sociology graduate student in the mid-1990s, I bought two of Professor Davis's book. 
I was recently flipping through my copy of Women, Culture, and Politics. The pages are yellowing, and I saw that I wrote margin notes in pencil for some reason, but I can still see them. I underlined the last paragraph in the introduction, which is relevant to our gathering today. Let me read it. What has truly surprised me is that young people on the campuses, as well as in the community, women and men, students and workers, people of all racial backgrounds, who are no longer seduced by a media image long, said, long since laid to rest, are attracted by the progressive politics associated with the campaigns with which I work. A number of years ago, activists in progressive circles began to detect an approaching resurgence of campus activism, along with a renewed vigor of labor activism. My own experiences abundantly confirm this prediction, and indeed today, in the latter 1980s, students and workers are organizing and demonstrating against domestic expressions of racism, against US collusion with apartheid, and against intervention in Central America. My own work over the last two decades will have been wonderfully worthwhile if it has indeed assisted in some small measure to awaken and encourage this new activism. Some of the specific elements have changed, but we're still fighting many of the same battles 30 years ago, after 30 years after Dr. Davis wrote those words. I am so glad that she is still in the trenches doing such incredibly important work. And now she is here with us today to frame our ongoing struggle for economic, racial, and gender justice. It is my great pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Angela Davis. Many, many thanks for joining us today, Professor Davis. Welcome. Thank you so much uh, for the wonderful introduction um, and for reminding me that um, I did write those words uh, so many decades ago. I'd like to thank the Human Rights Institute at San Jose State University for having invited me once again to join you. And this time on the occasion I understand of the official launching of the Institute as you encourage scholars and activists uh, and artists and advocates and others to insist that radical transformation of our existing social arrangements is possible. And thank you for reminding us through the work of the Institute that we all deserve to be free from cages and borders and from the racist incursions of police in our neighborhoods and barrios. I thank you for inviting me back to San Jose State. Um, I was last there some five years ago, I think. Um, this time during the period that has been defined by the massive responses to the state murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. I still have very vivid memories of my last visit um, uh, to the Institute just over five years ago, as I pointed out. And I want to congratulate you for your invaluable work during this last period. I am honored that you not only invited me to speak and join you in conversation, but that two days ago, you hosted a robust conversation among three of my sister comrades and close friends, Bettina Apteka, Barbara Ransby, and Nefertiti Tadiar. I've known Bettina since childhood and early on was active with her in a communist youth organization in New York. Uh, I met Barbara when she was still a graduate student and already an important intellectual and um, activist force on the campus of the University of Michigan. Um, I read Nefertiti's work before I actually met her and when she joined the faculty in history of consciousness, I knew we were kindred spirits. What I have learned over the years from these phenomenal scholar activists is invaluable. Those of you who had the opportunity to hear them um, two days ago witnessed three of the most perfect examples of scholars who use their considerable brilliance and their training in the service of transforming the world so that we all might know the meaning 
of freedom. As I listened to them speak about my work, it became clear to me, um, I, I should say at first it was, it was a little embarrassing, but then it became clear to me that it was not primarily about me as an individual, but rather about the ways in which I have attempted to channel collective insights and collective struggles. Uh, so I'm thinking about their comments on the first article I published uh, when I was in jail on black women during slavery. Uh, uh, they talked about the global implications of the work that I've been trying to do against the prison industrial complex. Uh, and especially considering the massive numbers of extrajudicial killings under Duterte in the Philippines. Uh, and they insisted on the importance of anti-capitalist critiques and socialist solutions, especially in relation to the structural character of racism. So once again, thank you, Nefertiti, Barbara, and Bettina. I'd like to say a few words about uh, the city in which uh, the Institute is located and which is the site of your intellectual and activist work. Uh, uh, thank you, first of all, for organizing the celebration of Breonna Taylor's birthday. Thank you for your work on a people's budget in San Jose and Santa Clara County, more broadly, that defines the ways in which funds can be transferred from the police and other carceral institutions to education and housing. I love the fact, I absolutely love the fact that you have come up with a plan to take some $5 million a year from the police budget to educate more than a thousand students at San Jose City College and Evergreen Valley College and San Jose State University. I am especially happy to see these new possibilities of change in the San Jose area. And in case some of you are not aware, I have a deep connection to San Jose. Uh, my trial took place in 1972 in the city of San Jose. And I was incarcerated uh, for quite a while in a jail in Santa Clara County in Palo Alto. Um, and sometimes shuttled to the jail in Milpitas for outdoor exercise. Uh, and also, and this is the reason why I will never forget my time in San Jose, it was in your city that I heard the jury pronounce a not guilty verdict, which gave me a new lease on life. It was, so to speak, the city of my second birth. And I also learned many lessons regarding the meaning of solidarity, especially across racial and cultural lines. In 1972, relatively few black people lived in the city of San Jose. Uh, and in the period preceding and during my trial, the local organizing was primarily focused on the Chicano community at a time when Chicano activists in the area were largely focused on uh, supporting Dolores Huerta, Cesar Chavez, and the farm worker struggles, they also saw fit to organize on my behalf. And I will be forever grateful and would especially like to pay tribute uh, to my late friend and comrade, Victoria Mercado, who worked with the Brown Berets, the Communist Party, um, the International Longshore Workers, uh, Longshore and Warehouse Workers Union. And she was at the forefront of so much of the organizing around my trial in San Jose. I also want to use this opportunity to acknowledge the invaluable intellectual contributions of people who were in prison. This work that we refer to as 21st century abolitionism has its origins in the intellectual work of prisoners. So 
let me focus for a moment on the intellectual roots of our struggles that are often overlooked or treated as insignificant. Uh, uh, this acknowledgement, for example, of the impact of the intellectual work of George Jackson and his analysis of the role of carceral punishment, for example, not only allows us to understand how the abolitionist movement emerged, it also tells us something about the nature of knowledge and the diverse expressions of the power of education, whether it is formal education in the way that it unfolds in, in your institution or whether it is knowledge as you recognize that gets produced in the course of engaging in struggle for change. And incidentally, I should point out that George Jackson was incarcerated in Soledad prison, uh, uh, not too far from San Jose for a significant period of time. And when he, Fleeter Drumgo and John Cluche were falsely charged with murder, the campaign to free the Soledad brothers was anchored in the city of San Jose. So let me encourage you to read George Jackson's work and read the work of, of other people who were incarcerated uh, during that era. Read the poetry of Erica Huggins written when she was in jail on the East Coast. Read about the 1971 Attica Rebellion. Although the idea of prison abolition is almost as old as the institution of the prison itself, I personally encountered this strategy when I myself was in jail and learned about George Jackson's idea that it was not enough to simply focus on the plight of political prisoners, of people expressly targeted because of their political beliefs and affiliations. Long before large bodies of, of literature critiquing the very notion of imprisonment as punishment developed, George argued that we had to begin to consider the part played by the institution of the prison as a major structural purveyor of racism. And remember that when the Attica Rebellion took place in September, 1971, as a response to the killing of George Jackson in San Quentin prison on August 21st, 1971. It was the first time the cry for abolition was raised in such a way as to compel people to take it seriously. And although abolitionism did enter mainstream discourse at the time, it was quickly extinguished in favor of emphasizing new, less obvious strategies of carceral repression. But this work continued to be taken up and developed by activists and radical intellectuals, especially in the aftermath of the creation of critical resistance at the end of the last century. So that last summer, in response to the police lynching of George Floyd, abolition emerged as a core demand of those who call for an end to structural racism. I'm offering you this abbreviated genealogy of abolition because as you do your work today to prevent prison construction, to shift funds from the police to education and housing, you can recognize that even when it appears that our voices have been drowned out by less radical calls for reform, the revolutionary impulse of our work can never be completely extinguished. And so many of us have called for abolition over the years, emphasizing always that this is our response to structural racism and to the fact that jails, prisons, and police are the most dramatic examples of the structural racism that has inflicted such lethal repression on indigenous and Latinx and black communities. 
We have always insisted that these institutions with their white supremacist histories have no place in the worlds we envision, the worlds that will truly demonstrate the meaning of justice, equality, and freedom. Since I have asked you to reflect on important aspects of the histories of our radical anti-racist struggles, I can't fail to evoke the Black Panther Party and the Brown Berets. But first, let me say that we cannot effectively counter racism, especially in its structural manifestations, if we do not simultaneously challenge hetero patriarchy. Masculinist views of our struggles cause us to fail to recognize the important role women have played. As a matter of fact, women are always the very backbone of our movements. But of course, the tendency is to downplay the role of women. We know that in the Farm Workers Union, it was Dolores Huerta who was behind major organizing campaigns and that she deserves to be recognized at the same level as Cesar Chavez. And Del Dolores, of course, continues uh, uh, to fight. She is a, a, a remarkable woman. As we enter into this new phase of struggles to dismantle structural racism, let us remember that although the leadership of the radical Latinx organizations uh, like the Brown Berets on, on the West Coast and the Young Lords on the East Coast, although the leadership was largely male, the, the work was enabled by the large numbers of women in the organization. And as far as the Black Panther Party is concerned, if we don't recognize the fact that the majority of the membership consisted of women, then we fail to understand the vital role that women have always played in our radical struggles. And let me point out that I'm using the category women in the broadest uh, possible way, uh, and especially as embracing um, uh, trans women. Uh, trans women of color, color have been uh, the most consistent targets of, of, uh, the, um, of the racist violence uh, uh, that we are trying to challenge during this period. Feminist understandings of our movements uh, go further than the role of gender in the composition of the rank and file or the leadership of our struggles. What we really appreciate about this new phase of struggles against police violence and prison repression is its emphasis on deeper analysis, revolutionary vision, and intersectional strategies. The era of Black Lives Matter has called forth from many parts of the world an insistence on understanding the part played by capitalism, by racial capitalism, in the devastating treatment of the majority of uh, the people of the world people whose ancestors suffered under the onslaught of colonialism in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America and the Caribbean, in the Middle East, and of course here in North America. Because feminism that is simultaneously anti-racist and anti-capitalist helps us to maneuver through complex relationships for the purpose of generating new ways of bringing political issues and struggles together. It helps us to produce a new sense of what it means to be in solidarity. We don't simply announce our solidarities with Palestinian activists, for example, who courageously confront the Israeli state calling for an end to the occup occupation of, of, of Palestine. Uh, uh, we recognize uh, the role that their struggles play in shedding light on the work 
that we are, are doing against the militarization of the police and indeed to dismantle uh, the police altogether. Yeah. Our solidarities with indigenous people who have always been in the vanguard of efforts to save our environment uh, must incorporate uh, uh, the um, lessons uh, that uh, we've learned into our campaigns against the police, against prisons. Uh, and of course, um, if we think about people fleeing the violence and um, economic uh, devastation who end up being barred by, by ICE and border police. Uh, uh, they end up being prevented from finding um, sanctuary. Uh, uh, this is another example of the fact that we need to generate uh, robust solidarities. Uh, Solidarities also with Filipina activists rising up against Duterte's Trumpian style fascism. Solidarities with black women in Brazil who are on the front lines of the challenge to Bolsonaro. The point that I'm trying to make is that we don't simply declare our solidarity. We figure out how to weave that solidarity into the struggles within which we are most directly uh, involved. And so when the new president, President Biden announces that he will end federal contracts with private prison companies, we do not simply engage in premature celebrations or we don't engage in premature celebration we respond with renewed criticism and radical vigor calling him out because there is an exception which effectively annuls the significance of this move. The exception, of course, is privatized immigrant detention facilities. And we say that all private immigrant detention facilities should be abolished and public ones as well. I, I mentioned the privatization of immigrant detention facilities precisely because private prison companies like Core Civic are making more profits on detention facilities than on anything else. That is the most profitable dimension of the private prison industry. So not only do we demand an end to immigrant detention facilities, we point out that when we call for the defunding of the police, we especially mean ICE, defund ICE, abolish ICE. Abolition feminism urges us to make these connections um, and, 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 and to also incorporate insights regarding uh, the um, interrelationality of issues into the struggles uh, we generate. And of course today, when we acknowledge that Black Lives Matter, we're not simply saying that Black people deserve justice, equality, and freedom. We're pointing out the positionality of Black people in US society as being the best measure of the meaning of democracy. And of course, not only in the US, our current efforts to identify and to begin to dismantle structural racism in prisons and policing, in the healthcare system, in education, in jobs and housing. This is a collective effort to ameliorate our society, to break down impediments to uh, radical democracy, socialist democracy, not only for black people, but for everyone. I say this uh, because of course, this is Black History Month and there's a 
patronizing way, a very patronizing way that some people uh, look at black struggles as if they only affect people of African descent uh, or as if they only affect uh, people of color. 21st century abolitionist discourses have emerged as the most radical calls for a better democracy. Their significance resides not primarily in the fact that we want to dismantle imprisonment and policing, which of course we do, but we see these institutions as profound impediments to the emergence of radical democratic socialist futures. Many of us argue that abolition is not primarily about the negative process of dissolution and elimination, but it is rather about clearing space so that we can imagine new institutions and new strategies of addressing issues that have been so overdetermined by structural racism that it is not possible to remove the racism without the entire institution collapsing. It seems as if many of us have believed in reform for so long that we have persuaded ourselves that reform is the only way. The history of both prisons and police has always been the history of efforts to reform prisons and the history of efforts to reform the police. But at some point, we have to recognize that reform itself is a myth and that Reform has become the very glue that holds these institutions together. If there have been protests directed at these institutions for the entire duration of their histories, doesn't it make sense to try something new? But we can't separate the development of abolitionist movements in this century from the emergence of a kind of feminism that defines itself as anti-racist and anti-capitalist. And this is why uh, we employ the term abolition feminism to refer to a robust approach to feminist practices, uh, um, feminist practices in the area of research, feminist practices in the area of activism. Um, and this approach, the abolitionist feminist, abolition feminist approach is not afraid to acknowledge interdisciplinarity, its own interdisciplinarity and not only academic disciplinarity not only academic interdisciplinarity, but a movement-based interdisciplinarity as well. One that is not afraid to attend to race and class and gender and sexuality and environment and ability simultaneously, always recognizing their linkages and interrelationalities. This approach to feminism has allowed us to understand that abolitionist movements are at their best when they incorporate global recognition and solidarity. So we get to follow abolitionist movements in Palestine and Brazil, in South Africa and India, and we get to understand what it means to locate our campaigns and struggles on a world historical stage and what it means to interact with others who are also striving to create global abolitionist futures. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Dr. Davis. Um, we will take a five minute break 
So everyone, including our guests, can take a trip to the restroom, get something to drink, do whatever you need to do. But uh, join us again in five minutes because we'll be turning to our other panelists. We'll be turning to your questions for audience Q&A for Dr. Davis and our panel. And we'll uh, get more into your questions, your concerns, and, and why I think you're here this evening. So thank you again to Dr. Davis for such a rousing, amazing speech that I'm sure I'll spend the next five minutes trying to figure out. And um, we'll come back and we'll jump in for Q&A. All right, see y'all soon. Welcome back everyone. I hope you had a chance to uh, take a quick break and do whatever you needed to do. And so now we're all energized and ready for the second half of this evening's event. And I wanna just, first of all, again, say thank you so much to everyone who's joined us from the Bay Area, around the state of California, around the country, and actually around the world. And our little shout outs earlier, we had folks from Australia and Europe and, and all over. So we're really, really excited to have you with us this evening. Um, like I promised, I'm going to invite now our two uh, panelists from one of our partner organizations here in uh, San Jose and Silicon Valley, uh, our friends from Silicon Valley Debug. And so I'm going to turn it over first to um, um, also, I, I'm also admittedly a, a, and, and, and proud member of San Jose uh, of, uh, Silicon Valley Debug myself. And so I, I've been very happy to know um, our two guests, not just professionally, but personally. Um, and I want to thank them for the bottom of my heart because it's really important um, for me and for my team that we get to work with folks like uh, Sharon and Jose, who I'd like to introduce to you all now, um, in the work that we do as, as an institute. Um, uh, much like Angela, and this is why, why we, we invite Dr. Davis uh, to, to do these kinds of events with us, um, is because she's someone who teaches us that, that we, when we do university work, when we do work in education, um, we should really be deeply engaged in, in solving the problems of the communities we serve. And it's only through our partnerships with organizations like Debug that we as an institute are able to do that kind of work and that we can really be grounded in, in, in doing the pursuits that we're, we're frankly paid to do. Um, so, so with that, what I'd like to do is introduce um, my friend and colleague, Jose, uh, to say a little something about Silicon Valley Debug and the Care First Jail Last Coalition. Hey, what's up? Uh... Uh, definitely honored to be here. Uh, I just want to take the time. You know what? Uh, Angela Davis is a badass. You know, uh, I don't know if uh, uh, I'm supposed to use my French. You know what I mean? But, uh, uh, man, she's powerful. Like, uh, uh, I can't really say it any other way. So it's a, definitely an honor to be a part of this panel and Zoom and discussion. Uh, so little uh, intro. I'll try not to take too much time, but... Uh, Debug, Debug's been around for about 20 years or so. Um, pretty solid uh, reputation as far as police accountability, criminal justice reform. Um, I probably became involved about 10 years ago. Um, and, um, you know, fresh out of county, I thank God that I never went to the pen. I probably wouldn't be here today, to be quite honest, if I ever did. So, um, you know, Debug kind of acted for me as a way to, to rehabilitate myself, um, but also uh, to empower myself and empower my, my community, right? And, uh, um, you know, um, so uh, it's definitely done a lot for myself as well as my community on both sides, you know. Um, as far as care for first and uh, jail last, I would have to say that it started probably... Uh, maybe five years ago now, to be quite honest. Uh, you know, uh, there was Michael Tyree, uh, a gentleman with uh, mental health. He was waiting on get it, getting a bed. He was supposed to already be released. He had some mental health issues and um, he was supposed to be released. And unfortunately his life was taken away by three correctional officers. Um, you know, uh, they were, they were found guilty of murder. Um, and uh, it's sort of a woke and a beast inside our Santa Clara County jails, as far as um, uh, the folks inside decided to, that this was time to organize. And sort of they started organizing amongst themselves and they went on a hunger strike to not only uh, a challenge, uh, you know, police brutality inside of the jail, but also indefinite solitary confinement, which in our county jail, the way it works is it's usually uh, what the county administration, uh, jail administration, they feel who you are. They they're sort of they 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 put you in indefinite solitary confinement based on who they think you are, 
and what they think you're going to do without any actual evidence. Um, and, um, and so they pretty much use hunger strikes uh, annually for the past four or five years because that's one of their only real ways to organize, to get some attention. Uh, last year, they decided to be in solidarity um, with Silicon Valley Debug uh, to really push our, uh, what is what, not, what we now call the care first and jail last sort of campaign uh, for criminal justice reform in, in our county, but also to, to stop, put a complete stop to this idea to build a new jail. Um, and so the, the jail that they had demolished, which is uh, uh, Main Jail South, uh, East Little Max, uh, that's where they were actually holding individuals indefinitely for solitary confinement, sometimes depriving them for weeks uh, of any type of uh, out of cell time. And so that was a major, major win uh, for our community and those inside. And uh, but the fight's still not over, right? They're still organizing outside, and we're—I st mean, they're still organizing inside. We're still organizing outside, you know. And um, and uh, now it's it's really, I'm I'm appreciative that it really took it took uh, uh, a lot of the uh, the conversations and and sort of uh, the attention right now as far as you know what do we do? Uh, what do we do about our situation right now? Is is a new jail or is jail at all even a solution? Um, you know what I'm saying? Uh, can we can we live without a jail? Uh, and do we need to have a new one? So appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. And I think uh, you could see in the chat, our audience really appreciated your words as well. And so um, for those of you asking more about debug, we'll continue to give some of those answers in the chat. And like I said, Jose and Sharon will be uh, with us and Dr. Davis uh, for the rest of the Q&A this evening. And so you can ask questions of our panelists, you can ask more questions of Dr. Davis, and we'll, we'll kind of have an organic conversation. Before Dr. Davis comes back to join us for that q and I'd like to turn it over to Sharon to say a little something about why she came to work as an organizer at Debug and to tell a little bit more about her story. Thank you. Um, I just um, want to say thank you. I'm, I'm happy and proud to be here. Uh, my name is Sharon Watkins, and I am a community activist with Silicon Valley Debug in San Jose, California. I have been involved with Debug since the killing of my son, Philip Watkins, six years ago today, less than one month after his 23rd birthday. He was shot and killed by San Jose Police Department despite a call informing a 911 dispatcher that he was having a mental episode. Currently, I am working to make policy changes at the state level to remove the laws and the lawmakers that turn a blind eye to the police violence in our communities and across the state. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharon. Um, and as you can see, um, uh, I think you've already touched many of those in our audience and um, we thank you for your kind words, everyone. Um, now I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Davis to join us again on the panel. And what I'm gonna do is have um, Jose and Sharon are gonna ask the first two questions um, for Dr. Davis. And then uh, I'll just uh, play moderator from there and, and I'll start including some of the questions from our audience for, for all three. So um, uh, Sharon, would you like to go first with the first question for Dr. Davis? Yes, um, Dr. Davis, my first question to you is what are your thoughts on the criminalization of our youth and the presence of police officers in our elementary and high schools? Well, first of all, um, let me you know, offer you condolences uh, on the death of your son. You said exactly five years, six years ago today. Um, and thank you for your work. Um, uh, this is probably the best way in which you can pay tribute uh, to your son uh, by getting involved in these movements uh, to um, contest and eliminate uh, police violence, racist police violence. Uh, yeah, um, it seems absolutely ridiculous that there are police in schools. I mean, you know, if we weren't so accustomed 
to school resource offices, um, we would uh, react with absolute astonishment that police uh, now are in elementary schools and middle schools and high schools. And of course they're on college and university campuses as well. Uh, it seems to me that we all need to focus on getting police out of schools. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, if we believe in the possibility of defunding the police, of, of, of creating new ways of addressing uh, the kinds of issues for which the police are called and for which they are not trained. You know, why is it that, that, that when someone is having a mental crisis and it, as, as was the case with your son, now, why is it that armed human beings are necessary? Um, what we need are people who are trained, people who are compassionate, people who recognize uh, that um, uh, the person experiencing the, 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 the mental health episode is in pain. We don't need people with guns. Uh, uh, and it seems to me that a good way to initiate a broad campaign to um, abolish the police is first of all, by getting them out of our schools. Uh, uh, school resource offices are, uh, uh, are more um, connected to police departments and owe their allegiances to police departments, not to education, not to schools. They prevent children from learning. Um, and as a matter of fact, uh, so many more children have been directly channeled into juvenile justice as a result of the presence of these so-called school resource offices. Uh, um, if, um, if they weren't there, so much of the activity that is criminalized would be recognized as something that kids do. This is just what children do. This is a process of growing up. Uh, uh, so I really appreciate the fact that, um, that, that, that you are concerned about the criminalization of young people and the presence of police officers uh, in, in, in schools. Uh, uh, and of course, when we talk about the school to prison pipeline, uh, it becomes even clearer uh, when we see that uh, uh, the, the, the police and the prison guards are already in the school. And, and, and so they're transforming the school into institutions of punishment. Uh, so yeah, this is a major issue and we have to get to work on this right now. I, I should tell you that um, one of the most interesting demonstrations I participated in during this period of, of COVID-19 was a demonstration, a, um, an automobile demonstration designed to get cops out of school. So we you know, drove around, um, I live in Oakland uh, and the, the demonstration was held there. And it was one of the, the most um, passionate uh, and militant demonstrations uh, of, of this period. Thank you so much, Sharon and, and Dr. Davis for that response. Um, Jose, you ready to go as well? Would you like to pose the next question? All right, all right. Let me see here. So I have, I have it written down. My memory is mush. Um, <laughs> and let's see here. Uh, hunger strikes in Santa Clara County jails to end indefinite solitary confinement, inhumane conditions, criminal justice reform, and as, as of recent, atrocious conditions of those positive with COVID-19 were inspired by hunger strikes in CDCR for alleged influences of what they call the big four, the NF, Mexican Mafia, Aryan Brotherhood, and Black Guerrilla Family. Having supported George Jackson, what do you feel about the current agreement to end hostilities between the four uh, major racial groups in CDCR in order to live peacefully, uh, be released from solitary confinement, uh, visit their families, and gain access to rehabilitation programs and other privileges? Um, well, thank you. First of all, thank you um, for your work, Jose. I, I really appreciate uh, the, the fact that, um, 
that you are doing this work that is designed to support um, uh, uh, sisters and brothers who are behind bars and ultimately to uh, uh, guarantee that they're uh, released. Um, yeah, hunger strikes. Hunger strikes are really the only way incarcerated people uh, can make their collective voices heard. And they have a very, very long history. Um, you know, I, I, I can tell you that uh, when I was first arrested in New York in 1970, uh, and they placed me in a, um, a solid, they placed me in solitary confinement, you know, I also went on hunger strike uh, uh, for about two weeks. Uh, uh, and the, the women in the jail, I learned that the women in the Women's House of Detention in New York also joined me in solidarity. Uh, um, so, yeah, I followed uh, the, the, the histories of the, the numerous hunger strikes that have taken place, especially here in the state of California. And and I also uh, am aware of the fact uh, that uh, much of the violence and hostility uh, uh, emanates from the prison administration. Uh, and, and, and of course you refer to uh, uh, the um, Nuestra Familia and the Mexican Mafia and the Black Guerrilla family and the Aryan Brotherhood that have been um, anchored in California prisons uh, for decades and decades. Uh, uh, one of the things that occurred to me when I was doing research on the role that prisons play is that uh, prisons provide the nourishment for backward ideas. Uh, if, if we think that um, if we think that segregation uh, is um, a part of the past of the US, all you have to do is go into a prison and you can see uh, that they use these strategies of apartheid, of racial segregation to promote the development of conflict. Uh, um, but I, 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 I welcome the um, end of hostilities. Uh, and I mean, it's interesting that it's, it has to be the prisoners themselves who, who do this work because the administration is not at all interested in ending uh, the, the, the conflict. Uh, I was thinking about a film uh, which I don't, it recently came out. You may have seen it. It's called Since I've Been Down. It's a documentary by Gil, Gilda um, Shepherd. It's a wonderful film that looks at uh, people in prison from a particular area, particular neighborhood of of of, um, of Washington, of, of of Washington and Tacoma, as a matter of fact. Uh, but what one of the most remarkable um, scenes in the film is a conversation between a black prisoner uh, who's involved in an educate in the educational process, who's involved in creating education when the prison administration refuses to allow the prisoners to have access to education. And a white guy who was a member of the Aryan Brotherhood, uh, who um, finally, as a result of his exposure to education becomes aware of the fact that, that it is in his interest to express solidarity uh, with black prisoners as opposed to uh, taking the position of uh, the of Nazis and white supremacists and Aryan brotherhoods, so um, yeah, I think that uh, this is this is a good development. But but of course, the prison authorities are always going to do whatever they can to rekindle conflict, to create because it makes it much easier to manage the population when. Uh, people are at each other's necks. Uh, uh, so that we have to ask ourselves, what can we do in order to uh, support this move? Uh, how can we who inhabit the free world, so-called free world, be of assistance to those who are behind bars? Th thank you, I really appreciate it. Uh, uh, I just love the fact that, you know, uh, 
with that whole story, you know, uh, these individuals who were su su supposed sworn enemies for decades have now come together to realize the only real enemy is the prison administration, you know, this, this sick, twisted system. So I appreciate you, Angela. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you all so much for that. So as promised, we're going to move to some audience Q&A for uh, uh, Dr. Davis and our panelists. And uh, I will move to those questions now. The first one is absolutely for Dr. Davis. And we have a few versions of this question coming in. So I'm just going to kind of group, group them all together into the one. Um, what does a world after abolition tangibly look like? We often see models of community-based rehabilitation. However, we were wondering how such a system would work in conservative areas or on a global scale. Well, um, first of all, abolition, abolitionist approaches urge us to look at the whole, not, at, not simply at um, the discrete problem of imprisonment. Uh, um, so we don't think about creating a better situation that will fit the footprint of the prison. Uh, and of course, prisons have, have, have been such a part of our landscape, both our um, real landscape and our ideological landscape that, that we, have to work to acquire the capacity to recognize that they don't have to exist, that they have not always existed. Prisons actually are a product of capitalism and of, 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 of the era of the emergence of what we, what we often call democracies, but what we should call capitalist democracies. So, so we're talking about the fact that prisons for punishment of first introduced in the US um, in the aftermath of the American Revolution. Uh, um, and, uh, and the very fact that the punishment of prison, imprisonment consists of the divestment of rights and liberties tells us that the prison is an institution that's intimately connected to capitalist democracies. Uh, because uh, if you punish people by denying them rights and liberties, they have to have those rights and liberties in the first place in order for them to be denied. Uh, so that's the connection. Uh, and, 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 and we're not suggesting that we need a better institution. What we're suggesting is we need a better society that we have to look at issues that at first don't appear to have anything to do with imprisonment, but of course they do. We have to look at housing. We have to look, we have to look at education. Uh, we, have, we have to look at healthcare, mental healthcare, as I, I was talking with Sharon about. Uh, and so the idea is to imagine and, and, and hopefully create a society that no longer relies on these horrendous institutions of violence and punishment. Uh, uh, so we were supposed to talk about socialism during uh, 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 this period. So we're talking about a very different kind of society, one in which you don't have to have money in order to have a decent place to live, in order to get an education, uh, in order to in in, in 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 order to have access to all of the things one needs uh, uh, as human beings, so we're talking about radical transformation of the of the surrounding society, uh, and then and then we get to ask ourselves, well. Uh, and, and this is usually where people go in the first place. You know, what do you do with all of the terrible people? You know, all of the terrible uh, rapists and murderers and so forth. Uh, um, and that is a question, what, what, what can be done with them? But we don't answer that question by putting everybody in prison, people who engage in, you know, uh, uh, petty crimes here, theft there, whatever. Um, 
But of course, we do have to figure out how to answer those questions. And we do not answer them by simply sending people to prison. As a matter of fact, if we want to understand why people engage in such horrendous crimes as, as murder and, and rape, uh, the best thing to do is to engage in the kind of research and questioning and understanding that will allow us to understand the issues that we need to address, as opposed to simply getting rid of the people who have the problem. And in my opinion, what prison does, it simply hides people who have problems. Uh, you know, whether they're economic problems or whether they're psychological problems, just put them away and then you can forget about addressing the problems. So we're talking about recreating a very different kind of world. This is amazing to get a, a, such a, a wonderful uh, lesson and, and direct lecture from one of the founders of abolitionist, sort of modern abolitionist politics. So I, I know I appreciate this and, and so does our audience. I want to thank our audience too, because I see we have lively debates going on in the chat. <laughs> this has been a very, very vibrant conversation all around, it seems. Um, I'm going to try and fit in as many of your questions as I possibly can. I apologize. We'll, we'll get as many of these in, 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 as, as, as we can fit. So next, and uh, maybe this keeps us on some of your, your comments on socialism and some of these economic questions. Um, reading here, the pandemic has only widened the gap between children in poor communities who have been attending distance learning in public schools versus the privileged who have been attending small groups of in-person private school. How could all of our communities bridge these gaps together? Hmm. Well, yeah, that's a that's a difficult question uh, uh, because the person who asked the question is absolutely right. Uh, you know, those who are relatively wealthy, those who are relatively affluent, uh, are able to shield themselves from the damage that is being done uh, uh, by uh, this uh, pandemic. Uh, those who um, uh, can't afford to send their children to private schools. Uh, you know, those who uh, have living conditions that uh, um, uh, militate against uh, the, the, you know, the kind of uh, a space that might be needed uh, uh, during this time of, um, you know, what we call lockdown, although you know, I, I, I don't like to use that term lockdown because, uh, because we know that there are some people who really understand what it means to be locked down. And, and those are people who are in prison. And they are also the ones that are suffering most uh, from uh, the pandemic. Uh, um, and we also know that an abolitionist response is the only response at this moment to address the predicament of prisoners uh, who uh, are exposed uh, more than anyone else to uh, the uh, COVID-19 um, um, virus. So I would, you know, I think that uh, what we should do is hold uh, the lessons that we are learning during this period uh, uh, very close and, and, and recognize that uh, there is an enormous amount of work to be done. Racism, structural racism came to be acknowledged as a phenomenon by masses of people as a consequence of the fact that indigenous people and black people and Latinx people were suffering most from the pandemic. And also we became aware of the ways in which racist ideas can be unleashed uh, uh, when we see that uh, uh, there has been such a massive increase in anti-Asian racism as a result of the way in which the, the, the last person to occupy the office of the, pres of the presidency characterized the uh, pandemic. So I, 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 I think that uh, rather than um, try to cobble together a particular solution to uh, the, the problem of, of 
education at this particular moment. Uh, let's see if we cannot create some lasting solutions, some lasting transformations. If we're talking about abolishing the police, abolishing prisons, we also have to ask ourselves, what are we gonna do about our schools? Uh, uh, because in, in the abolitionist community, we've learned how to say, uh, we've learned how to say education, not incarceration, schools, not jails, but schools for poor people are like jails. Uh, and, and, and education has for people of color and poor people has come to be so much like education that we, we can't assume uh, that uh, there isn't an enormous amount of work to do to produce a more equitable uh, system of education. And this is the work that we have to do now. Excellent, thank you. I wanna to go to another audience question. And um, so the audience member asks uh, about something that you talk about in your book, Freedom and as Freedom is a Constant Struggle. Uh, that the assumption regarding the significance of Obama's election as somehow the markings of a post-racial society and so forth was incorrect. This was also something that you problematized in your speech at San Jose State in, in uh, 2015 as well, um, you know, kind of pushing back against these notions that um, the election of Barack Obama was, uh, uh, um, again, a sign of this sort of post-racial society and these sorts of things. And um, the audience member asked, and I ask it again, because I, I know we even spoke for a few minutes about this the other evening as well. So now you have some thoughts on it. Um, what would you say uh, with, with regard to sort of a similar question in a similar vein of the significance of someone like Vice President Kamala Harris? Um, how would you um, sort of weigh um, the significance of, of, of her um, election um, with some of these other structural issues that, that you've been speaking about so eloquently? Well, um, yeah, I, I, that's an important question uh, uh, because uh, um, just as our first impulse was to celebrate when Barack Obama was elected, and you know, I live in Oakland, California, as I said, and and people were dancing in the street on the eve of, of that 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 um, election, and I. And I was extremely happy as well. This was a world historical uh, uh, event. Uh, the first time that a black person, a black man was elected to the presidency of the US. Uh, and so, yeah, we deserve to be able to celebrate uh, and we deserve uh, the, the joy and pleasure of that symbolism but at the same time, we have to be critical and we have to recognize uh, that, that the election of a black person to high office is not by itself going to transform anything. And I'm especially critical of the response to uh, the Obama election because so many of us just sat back and did nothing. I mean, what if we had had the kinds of demonstrations that we have recently uh, witnessed uh, uh, demanding um, uh, a change in the direction of, uh, of, of, of the Obama administration with respect, for example, to um, immigration. Uh, and we know that more people were deported during the Obama administration than at any other time. Why did we not stand up and say no? Uh, and there's so many other issues uh, I could point out. Um, but what I do wanna emphasize, and this is um, uh, a practice that uh, incorporates the kind of abolition feminism I was referring to before. It's a feminist response. Uh, an anti-racist, anti-capitalist, feminist response that um, allows us to work uh, within contradictions, uh, that um, um, allows us to both celebrate and be critical at the same time. Uh, and this is what I wanna do 
in connection with the election of uh, Kamala um, Harris to the office of the uh, vice president. Uh, uh, yeah, it's amazing that a black woman, a South Asian woman is now uh, the, in, in the second highest office of the country. Yes, and we have to claim that. But at the same time, we know her history and we know the role that she played in this state, uh, for example, in relation to capital punishment. It was not positive. Uh, uh, so I, you know, I think that um, we have to beware. I mean, I also happen to think that precisely because of the trajectory of Kamala Harris, she may be more susceptible to pressure now than before. And this is precisely why we have to generate the kind of uh, uh, pressure uh, to force her and Biden to move in directions uh, they probably do not now want to entertain. Uh, so yes, uh, let's be critical and let's celebrate at the same time. That sounds like an excellent approach. I like the celebration part too. <laughs> too much, too much darkness in our lives as yeah. of late. So celebration can always be good. Um, I'm going to move to yet another audience question. Uh, moving to the topic of immigration, you mentioned some things about abolishing ICE and immigration policy. So I figured this would be a good segue. Um, so the audience member asks, "Well, thank you for linking your work on prison abolitionism to the current unjust treatment of migrants." Would you agree that in addition to abolishing ICE, we should quite simply abolish borders? Hmm. Ultimately, yes. <laughs> Ultimately, yes. And let me say that, um, um, you know, oftentimes uh, people who uh, propose uh, what are considered to be idealistic solutions, utopian solutions, uh, uh, often uh, people don't pay very much attention to them. Uh, because they think that these ideas are crazy and they're never going to be instituted anyway. Uh, I mean, this was the response that, that many of us received uh, during the early period when we were campaigning for abolitionist approaches. Uh, people thought we were insane. What do you mean a world without prisons? Uh, uh, how can we exist without prisons? Even people who had relatives behind bars were reluctant to begin to think uh, differently and creatively about you know, how to address uh, these issues. Uh, so my sense has always been that we imagine what it is we want uh, and we continue to raise these issues uh, because if we don't, we forget we forget what it is we knew we wanted at one point. Uh, we forget uh, uh, that uh, we, we, we want schools, um, uh, free education and accessible housing and all of these things. Uh, when when um, people come up with new ideas for reform and, and um, this has been you know, the whole history of uh, uh, the, the um, uh, entrance of radical ideas into uh, uh, public uh, uh, discourse. Uh, uh, but I'm someone who thinks that ultimately we want a new world and that world does not have to be divided uh, by the militarized borders that we see around the world. Uh, now, ultimately, we want a world in which the nation state, which is a product of capitalism, the nation state is not the primary means of organizing human relations. Uh, and while that may not happen for many, many, many years to come, uh, we cannot forget that this is what we ultimately want. Uh, and so we ultimately want a world without borders. Uh, 
And we recognize now that the crisis uh, in um, uh, immig immigration and, and, and the efforts to seek um, a refuge uh, in other places, uh, the increasing numbers of refugees and migrants around the world, that this ultimately can be connected to colonialism and racial capitalism and to the way the world uh, was uh, 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 reorganized in accordance with the, uh, the capitalist uh, system. And, and so I think, I think uh, it's so important to remember that we're dealing with the reverberations of colonialism and slavery. We're dealing with racial capitalism. Uh, and, and we have to be able to imagine an end to this system if we want to believe that a future world where uh, humanity is respected, where all of the flora and fauna of the earth are protected. This is the only way. Excellent, thank you. Um, I, we have a couple questions here and it looks like we'll have uh, room for one or two more questions before we're in our sort of hard out for Dr. Davis. And so um, I wanna fit this question in because we've had several questions about this notion of international solidarity that you've mentioned several times uh, in this evening's talk. And so um, this is from one audience member. Could you go deeper in, a, I'm sorry, could you go deeper in elaborating on how movements that are struggling against the same structural forces can effectively collaborate and work together in solidarity and what looks like uh, um, sort of solidarity and movement in action together. Um, and they're um, talking about this in reference um, to your uh, um, ongoing solidarity with the Palestinian freedom movement and, and, and some of these other international connections that you mentioned earlier in your talk. Other audience members asked similarly, um, how did you work historically to build the kinds of international connections that you did across your political career? So again, we're getting lots of questions about um, that task in front of us, right? To make those kinds of um, sort of international connections of solidarity effectively in ways that can actually um, make a difference in those people's lives. Well, I really believe in internationalism. Um, and of course, as someone who is a member of the Communist Party and internationalism, uh, uh, really animated uh, communists all over the world. Uh, I, um, I'm, I was also the recipient of international solidarity. I don't uh, think that, that I would be living in the so-called free world today had not it been for the fact that people literally all over the world uh, joined the campaign for my freedom. And as a matter of fact, um, you know, I don't necessarily like to be the center of attention. I know I do, you know, a lot of talks, and but but that's that's not uh, what I um, most enjoy doing. I I um, I do this because I think it's important to let people know that uh, engaging in the kind of transformative activism we're talking about this evening can really make a difference. And I'm the evidence of the fact that it can make a difference because when I was in jail facing um, uh, three capital charges that could have at one point sent me to the uh, gas chamber three times, uh, people all over the country and all over the world stood with me. Uh, and, and, and we were able together to uh, counter the efforts of the, you know, I, I'd like to point out that you can't forget that uh, uh, Richard Nixon was the president and, and Ronald Reagan was the governor of California and Herbert Hoover was the head of the FBI and all of them were determined to see me go down. And um, I never could have uh, done this by myself. And I only did it with the assistance, not only of people in this country, but all over the world. So I believe in international solidarity. I, I began to be involved in generating solidarity for 
of Palestinian people when I was quite young, when I was still in college. Uh, uh, I have uh, been in solidarity with the Algerian revolution of, uh, you know, again, from the time when I was very young. I think that this connection with people who are engaged in radical and progressive struggles in other parts of the planet strengthens us. It makes us feel uh, more powerful. It gives us the courage that we lack as individuals or as, um, as, as people who uh, uh, are encapsulated in one particular locality or one nation. And so I absolutely believe that we have to generate uh, uh, solidarity, especially black people in this country because black people have been the recipients of, of solidarity since the period of slavery. Uh, uh, since Frederick Douglass went to Ireland and Scotland and Ida B. Wells went to Europe to call for support for the anti-lynching movement. Uh, and this has been going on forever since uh, the Jubilee singers from FIS traveled all over the world. Uh, I mean, this is one of the reasons why black music is a global phenomenon. US black music is a global phenomenon. And I say this because I think we uh, have to reciprocate. Uh, we need to produce solidarities with our comrades and sisters and brothers in Brazil, which is the country which has the largest number of, of people of African descent outside of the continent of Africa than any other. And also when we talk about racist police violence, if you really wanna understand the meaning of racist police violence, look at Brazil. You know, look at the assassination of Marielle Franco, who was challenging the militarization of the police. Uh, look at the black women who are in the leadership of the movement of, of Brazil. Uh, but also look at what is happening in, in the Philippines as Nefertiti was uh, describing two days ago. Uh, and and, 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 and look, look at Europe. Look at a country like France. France continues to insist that it is not racist because they have these beautiful um, universal notions of liberté, égalité, fraternité. But their world has been constructed on the, uh, uh, on the backs of slaves. Slavery uh, produced the, the, the wealth in France. And of course, um, uh, there are huge problems with racism, violent racism, police racism in France today. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, uh, thinking about uh, Adama Traore, uh, who uh, uh, from Senegal, who was uh, uh, basically extrajudicially executed by the police. Uh, uh, so we have these examples uh, in countries all over the world and if we only come together, then we can share experiences and share lessons. And we in the US need to get rid of some of our provincialism because even though many of us associate ourselves with communities of struggle, um, we have not overcome the idea that the US is the greatest country in the world. So we kind of carry that with us and we accept and expect that people will support us, but we don't uh, uh, try to figure out how we can take steps to support our sisters and brothers um, and comrades uh, in India, for example, uh, uh, in Nigeria, where they're also involved in campaigns against the police and South Africa, where they're dealing with a racist police structure, even though most of the police are now black. But the structure was inherited from apartheid and racism is still very much a part of a structure uh, that, uh, 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 of which the major actors are now black. So we can learn 
a really important lesson there about the meaning of structural racism, the meaning of systemic racism. So don't let me uh, <laughs> go on and on. And on. But I, I don't I, think so anyone's question. complaining. I, I'm not getting any uh, comments in the chat to tell her to stop talking so much. I, I don't think that's I don't think that's going to be an issue for us. And and with that, Dr. Davis, I, I would like to ask you one final question, only because we've had it so many times since um, you know, as you mentioned before. Um, so the first event of our series, we watched the incredible documentary by Shola Lynch um, on your case and uh, on, on that entire story and surrounding the context of San Jose. And one of the things that so many of our audience members have asked and so many of our students have asked, um, and, and I don't want to ask this sort of now cliche um, question about self-care and this sort of thing, but I think it is a, a, a genuine question when folks ask, you know, when they think very deeply about the kind of just literal pressures that have been on you as a human being. Uh, I mean, this is something that I wonder um, often um, that you've been through solitary confinement, you've been through, uh, um, you know, being in the eye of the world, many of whom are not wishing you well, right? And, and over and over and over again, you found yourself the target of this kind of ire through your work and through the risks that you take on behalf of, of others and yourself and your politics. And so we just have people asking all the time, like, could you just ask her, like, how does she survive all this? How, what does she do in order to not be just ground into dust by those kinds of weights and pressures? And I think any advice you can give, especially if we can all recognize that many of our young movement leaders are dying, right? They're dying because they're taking their own life. They're dying because they're disappearing at perhaps the hands of law enforcement. Uh, they're, they're not, you know, if we think about Ferguson, if we think about Chicago, if we think about, um, so I, I, I think this is, this could be that cliche kind of question, but I think on another level, it's a very real one, um, because we're seeing that, that so many people are, are really not surviving these struggles. And you're someone who have survived more than many of us can imagine. Um, so, so I would appreciate, and I think our audience would appreciate as a closing question, anything that you could offer. Hmm. Uh, well. I guess I could begin by saying that, um, you know, sometimes I, I'm really surprised that, that I'm still here and, and that I'm doing well, well my health is good, uh, I'm uh, continuing to participate. Um, and I say this because um, so many of my comrades uh, are not here and, and I've come to see myself as a witness uh, for those who uh, have, whose lives have been lost as well, to, to kind of uh, act as a witness for the work that we did collectively. And I think that, that the reason, that one of the reasons why I've survived is my sense of connectedness with other people. I don't, think of myself as an isolated individual, and I never have. And perhaps it's because I had the, um, now I would say good fortune to grow up under certain kinds of circumstances in the segregated South where we had to build community. Community was our only source of hope. And, and I've always relied on my community. Uh, when I have been places where I didn't necessarily have a community, then I've created that community. I, I've always worked with, and with other people and in, in concert with, uh, with others. Uh, and I would, I would suggest that, uh, that, 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 that people ask themselves uh, how they can begin to counteract the horrendous ideological impact of individualism uh, that is so associated with capitalism. Uh, uh, I've never seen myself as an isolated individual. Uh, and, and I've also pointed out that whatever courage I have is not courage that has come from within but courage that has come as a result of, 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 of uh, connectedness uh, 
with others. Uh, and so there's an important lesson there uh, because oftentimes uh, uh, people work so hard uh, that they literally kill themselves uh, uh, because they think they're the only ones who can do the work. I don't labor under that illusion. You know, I know that, 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 that what I can do is, is relatively limited. And I try to do what I can, but I always do it with others so that it feels as if I am doing so much more than I could have possibly done by myself. Uh, and that sense of uh, belonging to a collective uh, is um, so important uh, uh, in relation to self-care because uh, if I'm involved in a major campaign, and I, I, I can uh, give you actually a, uh, uh, an example. As we were organizing the conference Critical Resistance um, uh, and uh, the committee meetings all took place at, at, at my house, uh, uh, this was kind of the anchor. The house was, trans this very house that I'm in right now <laughs> was transformed into um, the, the center for the organizing of, of Critical Resistance. Well, I had a terrible accident then. Uh, I, um, I was um, running with my dogs and fell and, and broke my knee and had to be rushed to the hospital. Uh, and uh, I was in the hospital for, I don't know, several weeks. Uh, and the work continued because it was collective work. Uh, uh, and people even came into the hospital and we did the organizing. So as it, as it turned out, the fact that, that you know, I had to recover for um, a certain period during the conference, I was still in a wheelchair and on crutches, but I was there and, 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 and the work was done. And I did not labor under the assumption that I was the only one who could do it. I already knew that there was, there was so much that I could do and then, the rest had to be done by the other members of the committee and all of us felt that way. Uh, uh, so, you know, it's, it's really hard to encourage people to develop a different sense of themselves. But I think that is what is actually required. Uh, so that when we begin to talk about self-care, it's not simply self-care in an individual, individualistic framework. It's collective self-care. And as activists, we have to learn how to uh, pull our, um, our comrades' coattails if they're working too hard and to tell them, you've got to take care of yourself. You know, you can't sleep four hours a night indefinitely. You've got to get some sleep. You've got to do something um, that allows you to breathe and, 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 to, and to, to relax. Uh, and so uh, I've, I've learned this. Uh, I didn't always know this. I've, I think I've learned this primarily from my younger uh, uh, comrades uh, who've taught me about the meaning of self-care and, um, and have um, kept me on a path where I, I attend to my physical needs. You know, I practice yoga. I do Pilates. I go on hikes with my dogs, uh, and 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 I meditate. I attend to my 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 uh, mental and 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 emotional needs as well. And I like to do it in connection with others, uh, not simply by myself, but with others. Um, in a sense, um, we want to try to. Um, through the work that we're doing now, um, prefigure the world that we generate as a result of our work. Uh, and so we have to uh, also incorporate uh, ways of uh, producing happiness and joy in our activism. And this is why I think music is so important, music and visual art, uh, and the whole aesthetic dimension is key 
um, not only to self-care, but also to providing us a way, um, key to providing us a way to imagine um, uh, and feel uh, what we haven't yet figured out, you know, how to depict and how to, to, to say with our words. Uh, um, but yeah, I think I'll end by saying that when it comes down to it, we want happiness for, for everyone. That is what we want. We want a world where people have, uh, you, you're the Human Rights um, Institute. So there should be a right to happiness. Uh, uh, and, and we cannot achieve it if we do, don't practice it along the way. So we try to practice along the trajectory that we hope will lead us to a new world, that which we hope to experience in that new world. What a beautiful way to close. Um, and with that, um, Dr. Davis, let me just say, first of all, um, thank you so much uh, from the bottom of my heart. I'll speak on behalf of our core team, our entire institute, our students, um, San Jose State University. Um, you will always be welcome with us on our campus. You will always be welcomed by our team and by our, our coalition. And we are so thankful to have you as a mentor, as an elder, as an educator, um, and as an inspiration for all of this work. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that um, you can stay on for just a second and, and have your chat on. So what I'd like to do is ask my, our audience who's already doing this, if we can give Dr. Davis and our other panelists sort of a virtual round of applause and give her your love in the chat, we would really appreciate that. And as you can see, we've got folks tuning in from all over the country and the world. And um, I will say of all of our events, this has been the liveliest chat debates uh, uh, that we've ever had. It was very difficult to moderate and also pay attention to those conversations. So um, again, thank you so, so much um, to, to Dr. Davis. Thank you so much to Jose and to Sharon and our partners at Silicon Valley Debug. Um, again, I think the audience is joining me right now in our gratitude for you. And we'd like to let you um, go ahead and, and, and go about the rest of your evening and your week, uh, um, all, all of our guests. And I'll close by, by simply thanking once again our sponsors, our generous co-sponsors for supporting this year's series, Mosaic Cross Cultural Center, the Cesar Chavez Community Action Center, the Ethnic Studies Collaborative, the College of Social Sciences, the Departments of African American Studies, Sociology, Justice Studies, Political Science, Journalism and Mass Communications and History, and our community co-sponsors once again, Silicon Valley Debug. Um, one more time, if you would like to know more about us, you can see us on our website. And if you'd like to donate, and for those of you who have the means and would like to support this kind of work, please also visit our, our donate page as well. We have the website and the donate page going up on the, the, the screen and in the chat. And again, um, we will see you next year at our next human rights lecture series. We'll do this every year as, a, as an annual event where we will invite back not just um, our close, close friends like Dr. Davis, but lots of other um, really wonderful guests that we, we hope to bring and continue to expand this community of, of, of our let's say our heroes and heroines uh, um, that we follow and that we seek for guidance, but also all of our younger movement leaders who are really trying to come up and, and, and follow in those footsteps. So thank you again, once again, all of our guests. Thank you again to our audience. Uh, we very much appreciate you joining us this evening and we hope you have a safe and happy rest of your week. <laughs>